Okay, Vince, I'm going to come to you. What do you think of this idea of uh, canceling debt for developing countries, um, or do you have other radical solutions you'd prefer? Well, you could, I mean, canceling debt is a, a fairly standard procedure for very poor countries, um, and it's not a problem. Uh, I think you have to distinguish between different kinds of developing countries, I mean, radically different. You've got China and India, which are continental economies, um, they have internal debt problems. I don't know whether you read in the paper the last few days, there have even been riots in Chinese cities the last few days because you know, a big property company is sort of loaded with debt, about to go bankrupt. It's going to affect the rest of the banking system. So, you know, but it's an internal problem for China, nothing to do with us. Uh, similarly, you know, you know, in India, you get state banks that lend money to farmers, politicians go around and have what they call debt mellers where they write off all the debts of the farmers and that creates bad debt for the banks and so that there are internal issues affected with debt that those countries have to worry about it's not an international problem and then you have the poorest countries in Africa you know, very low income countries which where most of their debt is as a result of um, aid you know they borrowed money from the World Bank or from uh, British DFID, or increasingly from the Chinese banks, um, and they accrue a certain debt with it. But you know, these are very, very poor countries, um, particularly at times of distress when world commodity prices are very low. For example, you know, coffee is fetching half or a third of the trend price. You know, they default, or they have to default. They simply can't pay it. It's not that they won't pay it; they can't pay it. Uh, and there is a procedure. Um, partly through the so-called Paris Club um, and partly through aid agencies collaborating where but we, we write off some of the debt and that's a, a good thing to do and sensible. Um, the problem at the moment is that Western countries are reluctant to write off the debt because they worry that the money will then go to service the Chinese debts and the Chinese are reluctant to give debt relief because they think the money will be used to pay our institutions. So there's a bit of a standoff. But you know, in terms of concept, there isn't a big problem. The real issue, which is going to hit us very hard in the next year or two, is in the big emerging economies. Brazil is probably the first in line. Turkey, certainly Argentina. You know, these are semi-developed countries which borrowed heavily when the economy seemed to be doing well in a boom time, commodity prices were high, people had a lot of confidence in them, and they borrowed from um, US banks, British banks, and now they face a situation where their income is stagnating, interest rates are going up, and you, know, you get to a point where either their governments get into high levels of inflation, which is not beginning to happen in Argentina, they're back up to 30-40%, um, or they simply default. I mean, Argentina has defaulted, what, well, four times since the war? Seven, eight times. Seven, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, some countries like Guatemala have been defaulting every few years since 1800. Um, it, it's actually become a, a bad habit in some of those countries. And you're mostly there dealing with commercial debt, and there's a bargaining process in which the IMF may or may not get involved. And there is no good argument for just writing off the debt. I mean, it's not a humanitarian issue. It's a question of the, the balance of um, you know, whether, you, whether one wants to be penal or, or not and, and to establish their credit worthiness. But it's not a moral issue. Whereas I think if you're dealing with Uganda or you know, Ghana, it, maybe it is a moral issue. Mm. Is there a solution to the emerging markets debt issue? Well, not, the, not for the poorest countries, but as you say, the kind of the real issue, the real, the real crux of the issue. Well, I guess Brazil will probably try to keep its debt service. They value their credit worthiness. The Argentines are just, you know, um, <laughs> they, they just default over and over again. Uh, and there's nothing much you can do about it apart from changing mm. their politics, but we can't do that. No, no. Stephen, same question to you. Um, you know, Economists like to talk about moral hazard, that yes. aside from the poorest countries of the world where there's an argument to canceling their debt, a lot of debt in emerging markets, um, you know, should that, w if, you, if you were to cancel their debt, does that create a moral hazard issue where whatever led them to accumulate the debt, it just perpetuates that behavior? 
So it partly depends on why they got the debt in the first place. And of course, we know from the Cold War that many uh, poorer states in sub-Saharan Africa were in debt, partly because there was a battle uh, of kindness, in one sense, between the Soviets and the Americans to, to offer them lots of money. And when things went badly wrong, the Cold War itself came to an end. Uh, there was no interest in actually continuously perpetuating those loans once the Cold War was over. So they ended up in terrible, terrible trouble. Um, but let's come back to Argentina. Uh, obviously, Vince is particularly keen on Argentina. Um, and I think there's lots of reasons for, for being a little bit skeptical about Argentina. So you go back to around about 1890. Argentina is one of the richest economies in the world. And actually, if you were to look at Argentina's progress over the previous 20 years, and you were betting on how successful it would be compared with, say, Germany at that time, you might well have concluded that Argentina today would be the richer country uh, rather than Germany. Oh, you'd have been wrong, uh, but it wouldn't seem like a particularly stupid bet back in 1890. And Vince is right. Much of Argentina's difficulty is a sort of domestic political economy difficulty. It has a structural problem, um, which is that uh, for many years it's had an unusually low level of savings domestically. It's just a structural demographic issue, which is different from perhaps other countries. And because it has that low level of domestic savings, it is very, very dependent and has always been dependent on money coming in from abroad, if you like, the kindness of strangers to make sure that it can actually invest for the future, grow rapidly and expand. Unfortunately, Argentina's domestic politics and political economy have not been consistent with looking after the interests of those foreign creditors. In other words, you come back to, I think Argentina's had more financial crises than any other country over the last 100 years. And if you are a perpetual crisis country, whereby you seem to play fast and loose with the creditors' money, the chances are that your initial prospect of success will fall away very quickly. So you might say, well, forgive Argentina its difficulties currently, but if you were to do that, it would in one sense perpetuate a sense that Argentina can get away with the kind of behavior it's demonstrated over the course of the last 100 years. So I, I think what is slightly worrying about this, and where I, where I think with, with Grace's comment about the global north and global south, I think the global south is, is, is there's much more granularity than I think you've described. There's, there are so many different kinds of countries out there with different sets of problems. Uh, to lump them all together, I think, is probably a mistake, in, in my view. Uh, I, I would suggest that there are plenty of countries out there that, yes, have difficulties. I think particularly parts of sub-Saharan Africa obviously have difficulties. And as Vince says, yeah, they default. Uh, but at the same time, there are others who, frankly, um, I think have brought some of their problems upon themselves and haven't learnt the lessons from the past to make themselves attractive countries to be invested in for the future. Can I quickly, very quickly respond? So I think there's a, a question here about why debt is being accumulated and reaccumulated by some of the, the poorest countries in the world. And uh, it's easy to just say, well, they're just irresponsible governments. And that's why, you know, you had debt cancellation and then uh, things went badly again. Of course, the, part of the reason that we had debt cancellation in the first place, particularly for many of the poorest countries in the world, was that those countries had what we called odious debt. So debts that were left over from colonialism that weren't taken out by democratic governments and were therefore cancelled because, you know, basically people were paying the price for governments that they had no accountability to. You see that a lot uh, continuously today um, with autocratic governments basically taking on lots of debt and then the poorest people in those societies being forced to pay the costs of that. We saw that recently with a scandal of British banks facilitating lending to, um, I think it was Mozambique or Angola, uh, and that money basically disappearing into the pockets of corrupt officials, and then you know those countries defaulting, and it being, again, the poorest people in the world who are being forced to pay for the consequences of that. The reason that a lot of these countries continuously accumulate more debt when that debt has been cancelled is because they are often, particularly the poorest countries, less so for the semi-peripheral countries, in a position of um, you know, dependence and exploitation within the global economy. The reason that China has been able to get out of that position is because it's been able to kind of get around a lot of laws around intellectual property, which have allowed it to develop high value, high value manufacturing by forcing Western multinationals to get into partnerships with domestic companies that have facilitated its own development. A lot of other countries are and will remain dependent upon commodities exports and commodities prices obviously go up and down they go up and down daily they go up and down in a big super cycle and when you see a big collapse in commodities prices then those countries can no longer pay their debts so really the only way to get those countries out of this trap of accumulating debt is allowing them to develop allowing them to industrialize allowing them to develop a sustainable path towards growth and that requires not just aid not just transfers but actually the sharing of intellectual property rewriting tax treaties, rewriting investment treaties. So I think we're agreed for the poorest countries. 
To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.